One of the biggest treats about Coast Film Festival is its uh, support and local support. And uh, when you get that support from a filmmaker, but a filmmaker on the level of uh, who we're about to bring out here, director of the film that we just watched, um, it means so, so much. Uh, so without further ado, how about a round of applause for Greg McGilvray and Nick Wood, music director. I think we have too many chairs, but that's... I'm sorry, did I say... I'm sorry, Steve Wood, yeah, my, my bad. I just do that. I've, yeah, how many people have I uh, <laughs> talked to this week? So my, condolences, apologies. Um, welcome again. If, if it's uh, just so we can get to do this, I'll keep coming back every year. <laughs> um, how many people have seen all of Greg's films in the IMAX? So I have to see a show of hands, right? So thank you for your undying support for Coast Film Festival, but even a bigger thank you for sharing so many stories that are visually aesthetic and compelling, but always seem to have this purpose that makes us want to get, get involved. So thank you. You know, I think it's interesting seeing this film now. It's, it's 13 years old now. And when we made it initially, uh, 2008, um, we were suspecting that there was going to be a problem with the Colorado River. And right now, the water districts all in Southern California are sweating it because the Colorado has dropped so much. You saw that the, the, the bathtub rings there at Lake Mead and Lake Powell, now they're twice as deep. And basically, we're going to be running out of water. And so what the purpose of this film was, everyone who saw this film, and about 10, 10 million people saw it in 50 countries, um, and ev everyone in the United States got a piece of paper that gave them five or six things that they could do to save water at home. It was a peel-off sheet on a big, big board that was in the lobby of each one of those theaters. And it really did work. So a lot of people, that Kohler, the toilet people, were our sponsor. And in the lobbies of the theaters, they would have a low-flow toilet sitting in front of their big display. And people use that as a photo op. <laughs> which was kind of funny. It's pretty genius, actually. <laughs> yeah. And it, it worked for them. They sold a lot more toilets and water flow, uh, low flow uh, shower heads. And, and you can save a lot of, like the advice at the end of the film, you can save a lot of gallons of water uh, every year by just being conscious at home, conscious of, of your fresh water use. Well, it's, uh, I mean, I wish you were not the harbinger and ahead of your time, but you really were when it comes to the water issue. You know, there's a shot of the Hoover Dam in this movie, and I believe the Hoover Dam within just a matter of years, we're years away where it can't, it won't even be able to produce electricity, right? The water flow is gonna be too low. Yeah. Um, so I, I, I couldn't help but notice too, watching this film, yeah, it, you have to see it in IMAX and 3D, but the, the work that goes into just the weight of an IMAX camera, then the 3D component. Um, it harkens back to my experience as a child going to Disneyland and seeing that 360. I was so, I was so taken aback. So maybe, maybe you could talk about the process and the challenges when you're working with IMAX, the weight of the camera, and what you have to do as a filmmaker to think in such a grand scale, a canvas. It's, it's a little bit more different when you're doing five summer stories with a tripod on the beach, right? <laughs> Completely different. You know, the the cameras that we use um, are, the, the, the big 3D camera that we shot this film with is about 400 pounds. So it, it takes three or four people to lift it and then to get it in some of the places, it took 20 people to get it up into the places that we wanted to take it. Um, it's worth about a million dollars and so you don't want to flip the raft with it inside because it's not waterproof. Um, there were all kinds of cautions. It breaks down an awful lot because it's the most sophisticated motion picture camera ever built. Um, but it shoots beautiful images. And of course now everything has changed to digital and it would have been about a hundred times easier to shoot this movie digitally. But back then, that image shown on a screen that was eight stories high and you'd be wearing 3D glasses and when you got splashed in the face, 
like going through the rapids. It was jarring. It was so much fun. Yeah, the moves into it, just into the, the catacombs and the canyons, it's so, it's so much more visual when you see it in that, uh, that 3D experience. I, I, I love that I brought up Five Summer Stories because it allows a perfect segue into music. I know back when you were doing you know, surf movies, publishing and getting music was a little bit looser but now you're doing, you know, when you started doing movies like this where it's, you know, you're getting the, the likes of Dave Matthews. To maybe talk about the music process. And, uh, yeah, when it's an IMAX movie, obviously, it'd probably be a little bit easier to get artists uh, to be interested on jumping on board. Let me just introduce okay. Steve Wood. Yeah. Because Steve has done 30 of our IMAX yeah. films. <laughs> But he started out doing Five Summer Stories with his band Honk. And, and then Honk disbanded and he went to work with, with uh, Kenny Loggins' band for 10 years. And now he's back in town with his wife and kids and playing at various venues. Um, but he's done the best film scores that I can ever imagine. He's made our films 10 times better than they'd ever would have been. But he worked on this film with, with Stefan Lazard and the Dave Matthews band. So I take it away. What was the question? <laughs> well, just, yeah. I've already the, forgotten. Well, we're, yeah, working, working with the likes of Dave Matthews, and when the, the films get to this level, um, I, I think the, the music even takes even that much more of a, of a role. Well, yeah, yeah. That, that is kind of something that's different about these kind of films is a normal, like a Hollywood film. There's, uh, you know, more of a plot. It's more, music is more in the background. It's kind of like a wallpaper. You, you don't really necessarily leave a movie thinking about the music because it was just there to help you feel the emotion of the picture. So, but, but this is a little bit different. It's somewhere more closer to a, a thrill ride or something where, you, you know, you're really trying to get jacked up with the emotion of the picture and the visual. So we could really feature the music more. And so as a composer, it's, it was a great gig because you're not really always supposed to be in the background, you know, and if there's not a lot of talking going on, you can actually play melodic kind of music that pulls you into the music and makes you notice it. At least it makes me notice yeah. it. I don't know about you people. Well, and I, <laughs> I mean, you both are artists, you know, respectively in your own, in your own lane. Do you, was there ever, kind of you guys ever not see eye to eye or is it, uh, you have to trust him and you just, give him the creative license that he needs to do, or is it a push, push well, and pull? I, I completely trust Steve. And as, as Steve, Steve Wood, as well as Steve Judson, who is the writer and editor of this film, and he lives in Laguna Beach on Diamond Street. And the, the, the connection that Steve Wood and Steve Judson and I have had for the past 30 years is really rare and really magical because we all get along and we all have our sights on something that we haven't ever gotten to before. So we're continually trying something new. And Steve, the way he dealt with pretty much the celebrity folks that we were able to get involved in our films, you know, like, you know, um, uh, Paul McCartney and George Harrison and, and the Dave Matthews Band and, and a host of others. It, it was really, you know, it was wonderful the way that he navigated that and spent about a year's time on each one of these scores. And they're beautiful, beautiful scores. Well, I was going to say, too, that one thing he was emphasizing was the beauty of the relationship that we had. It's kind of a classic Laguna experience in that it wasn't a corporate thing you know you weren't always wondering or worried about somebody doing a power play behind your back that had nothing to do with what you were trying to achieve and we were always on board to try to do something great like Greg said and you know Greg complimenting me all the way the other thing is is he really wanted to do something great artistically and emotionally and to try to motivate people to be better about the environment and that that was the core of what we were doing so for me you know, I was ha happy to be part of that and support it and not worry that we were worried about anything other than trying to make something of a high quality that would move people. It, uh, I've heard that theme bubble up in so many of our panels this week of people that were on a path, they're, maybe they're in a law firm, 
and they leave the law firm. They end up at Surfrider. Um, someone's a biologist, and all of a sudden, no, nope, I'm going to start an ecology center. You know, it's, um, it's incredible to see that you can take a passion, pivot, and find a path. So the question is, Greg, when, when did, you know, filmmaking, you had a, a love and passion for filmmaking. When did it, when did it click where, oh, wait, I can do films that there's a story, and I'm going to, you know, inspire and get people to be involved? I think, you know, I've always loved the ocean and loved nature. And so even the first films, um, you know, my first surfing film, which I did when I was in high school, and then it came out the freshman year of college, um, it was really about the beauty of nature. And it was probably the weirdest surfing film ever made. Um, and I'd never suspected that it would ever draw an audience. Um, as I paid for it as I, as I, as I worked and, and made the film. But <laughs> when it did show a profit, it was, it was a big shock to my parents and I. And, and so I had to decide, well, gee, do I make another one now? I have like three times more money than I did before. And, uh, and they said, yeah, go for it. Why not? <laughs> anyway, so it, my, my career kept going. But being concerned about nature and being concerned about conserving it for future generations, I think has been in almost every Californian's heart since the beginning. Because what we have here is truly magical and unique in the world. Um, did anyone go out today? Did anyone go to the beach and <laughs> look at the ocean? Oh my yeah. gosh. And you end up going, and it's in the middle of November. It's not supposed to be like this. And, I mean, you have to conserve that. You have to make it sure that the water that we drink is, is, is conserved in a way that we can have some in the future, um, that our oceans are clean, that our hillsides are pristine. And basically, we're doing that here in Laguna. We're very conscious of our environment. And I think that's the way Steve and I have been, and I know you too, Pat, and it's the way we all should be. How about, um, yeah. <laughs> um, you know, making the, the, the comparison between the early days, like you said, you know, a set of sticks, a camera on the sand versus these, you know, the big IMAX cameras and the big, big productions. Is there something, or is there a part of the, the nimble factor that you miss, the, the, the rawness, or was it, is it something, it's just the natural evolution? If you could go back, would you, and if so, why? Well, you know, the, right now, you know, we are basically going back because digital filmmaking, you can shoot almost an IMAX image with a camera that's about the size of that little thing right there, um, but, or a shoe and about the size of a shoe. And so it's a completely different world. Um, when we were mounting IMAX cameras on surfboards and on hang gliders, th that was a very specialized camera. And it was worth $300,000. And if the, the guy crashed the hang glider, well, we were at a lot of money. Today, you can almost get the same thing out of a little GoPro camera. And the so it, I am going back, basically, and it's a lot simpler, but your imagination is freed up to do all kinds of wild things. And so that side of it is even more fun. I mean, it opens up the possibilities. What you used to pay, like two helicopters and a West Cam, you've, you know, with drone technology that you can have DSLRs, you know, and, or even, you know, proper cameras on a drone these days, right? So it, do you, do you, are you still kind of tinkering with things that you wait, never was possible, but now it is? Absolutely. Yeah. You know, the, you look at the shot that they do. It's, it's the first shot of the little promo piece for the Coast Film Festival. It starts downtown Laguna and then rises up the mountain and then goes into this wilderness and you're flying over a dirt road into absolute wilderness. If that doesn't get more people to move to Laguna. I don't know what, what would. There's only you so know, much space. I mean, <laughs> that is so amazing, yeah. that shot. But that was all done with a little camera and a drone. And you couldn't have done that 10 years ago. 
Can I ask, uh, just jumping back to the music question, it's something I wanted to hit earlier. Um, like I said, do, you know, when you're doing films on this level, you do get to bring in a certain caliber of musician. Did you ever have, um, you mentioned some pretty notable names, but was there ever one musician where you're like, okay, I'm, I'm as a fellow musician, I'm fanning out right now. Did you ever? I'm, I'm doing what? I'm fanning out. Fanning out. Like you're basically, as a musician, you're, you're having a moment like, this is so cool. I can't believe I get to collaborate with this person. I, I think I only get that from athletes yeah. <laughs> because it's not something I do. You know, but from the musician standpoint, I don't think that ever really, and I think in a certain kind of way, that's why I worked so well with them because I just felt like I was talking to someone that's just a person. Right. And so, I mean, we, we had some incredible experiences with some of these people. Uh, and, you know, looking back on it, I think, wow, I can't believe I did that. I wish I would have videoed that experience just so I could show it to people. But it was just a, a matter of, it was just a passing day, just working with somebody. The other thing is, this, am I putting, am I doing a lot of this? <laughs> <laughs> the other thing is, you know, a lot of these films we did were also international kind of music. You know, we did stuff down in Indonesia and Saudi Arabia and all these different kinds of places. And that gave me an opportunity to work with local musicians in those places. And that was an expanding thing for me to go to these other places and discover a new kind of music and spend a lot of time trying to figure out what made that music work. Finding soulful musicians there to work with and integrating, you know, bringing our cuisines together to come up with something new and discovering, you know, being able to work in a, a group of people who are really all striving to do something good. You, you know, in a lot of work that you do, there's, there are problems with personalities and people. And that we, I got to work with so many enthusiastic, artistic, creative people who really wanted to contribute their, you know, in the, in the best way they could. So what a life it made for me to be able to do this it, work. It gets back to the purpose. So how long has this relationship uh, gone on? How long have you guys been uh, working together? Well, we started yeah. in uh, 1970 wow. when the honk band was playing at a little French restaurant right where uh, Nick's is right now. And you know, I was I was two year old two years old. I was at that yeah, show. Yeah, <laughs> and and um, and the film that we were working on, incidentally, Five Summer Stories, you know, became a big big success. Guess what? Next year we're celebrating the 50th anniversary of Five Summer Stories, and Enoch wants to do some sort of a live show. Why wouldn't we? Right. <laughs> <laughs> We're gonna... With the Hawk Band playing as the movie plays. Live, a live score right here. Yeah. Now, I don't know if it's possible. It's possible. Can we get a visit? Can we get a, just a, you know, a verbal? I could do it. I'll, I'll sign it. Okay. There we go. You guys heard it here first. Let's lock it in. All right. Well, um, I just want to thank you again for, like I said, uh, just being such an incredible supporter of Coast Film Festival um, on behalf of the Benz and Enoch, myself, and uh, just, it's, it's, we're so lucky to have you here in Laguna, and please keep doing that, uh, keep the goods coming. It doesn't hurt when the, you got the golden dulcet tones of Robert Redford on the track, but uh, just, yeah, thank you, Greg. So how about a round of applause? Yes, Greg McGilbray, Steve Wood.